Hi everyone, welcome back to Random Film. Today we are bringing you another, our other, another top ten. Uh, this is the good performance, shame about the film top ten. Mm. Uh, this is part one, so this is going to be our ten to sixes. I'm joined once again by Oliver, Holly, and Michael. Um, Ollie gets first full named when Holly's on, <laughs> just because of the accent. <laughs> um, I'm going to kick Ollie us off all the mentions. <laughs> yeah. Um, now this we've we've all kind of said this was tough because I, I for for me personally there's a couple in my list where if someone if someone heard me saying this is a bad film they might go that's not a bad film right yeah but in parts it's whether I liked it or not and then in some parts it's the performance of that person was so much better than the film was so it's that kind of thing there are films in here that are awful. And just one person decided to stand out in it. But my two honourable mentions are two films that came up on my crap I love list. So I refuse to say that they are bad films. Um, so I put Robin Williams for Flubber. Shout uh, out. Yeah. And <laughs> Colin Farrell for Daredevil. Um, shout out. Oh, God, that's a great shout. Now, yeah. but at the same time, I could have done Michael Clark Duncan for Daredevil as well. Um, so... I was a bit like, mm. similar to that. That put me off a number of them because it was like, so one, I'm going to call it a dishonorable mention because I saw it in a bunch of the lists that Holly kindly provided. Like that sent me on a bit of a rabbit hole. And every single one of them had Matthew Lillard as Shaggy in Scooby Doo. And I resent that pick because I think Scooby Doo is an okay film. I think it does exactly what it sets out to do. And I think everyone's cast really well in it. I think Sarah Michelle Gellar does a great job. Freddie Prinze Jr. does yeah. a great job. Uh, Linda Cardinelli does a great job. Like, they're all fantastic. So to see, I get why people single out Matthew Lillard because he's really phenomenal. But like Scooby Doo, I just didn't agree that that like I've made sure, like Adam, I picked genuinely bad films. Like so, I resented that. What like and. Yeah, Colin Farrell is a great shout, though. I'm annoyed I didn't think of it. <laughs> oh, um, Holly, have you got any that you want to mention? Yeah, and a few that we mentioned in the Villains podcast or people who came up. Um, Michael Fassbender in many things. I think he he uh, we do know him in a lot of very good films, but he's also in a couple of trashy things too. Um, and uh, as Magneto, especially in some of the... Uh, not very good uh x-men prequels some mm. are good some are not but he's always top notch and i love ian mckellen so it was a hard sell that someone was going to be portraying that character as the younger version and in the first 10 seconds i was like yeah he's nailed that um and he he does all the way through all of them um uh jason momoa in justice league uh i mentioned justice league already um i thought he was the only one who was having fun yeah, definitely. Really, <laughs> genuinely. Uh, uh, I know that you can have a different tone with a superhero film. We love uh, Christopher Nolan's Batman um, series, and he absolutely shies away from the campy, fun tone and, and goes for something very serious, and it works. But I, I just feel like some of those characters are so silly that a, a, a slightly more fun tone could have worked in the mm. DCU films a uh, personal preference um but Jason Momoa was the only one who who was doing that for me um quite a few people in the Star Wars prequels but we'll talk more about that later I am sure yeah. um, Viola Davis in almost everything she's in that isn't top notch I couldn't decide between Suicide Squad or The Help she's mm. the best thing in both of those um Margot Robbie is great as Harley Quinn, but I think Viola Davis just pips her as as that um, villainous character. Um, and Paul Bettany also in almost everything he's in. He's in a couple of really stinky rom coms and he's good in them. Um, but I think he's also very good in the Da Vinci Code, which I thought was pants. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Michael, you got any? Um, yeah. So one because I haven't seen the whole film, but I've seen enough clips of it. Uh, Matt Smith in Morbius. Yeah. Because uh, that <laughs> film is bad, but he, from the clips I've seen, really does... Because well, if you just saw the clips of him in it, you'd be mistaken of thinking, 
this looks like a good film. And they'd go and watch it and realise that, no, there's just, Matt Smith is just excellent at essentially almost everything he does. Um, and Kelsey Grammer as Beast in um, X-Men 3. Um, yeah. Not incredible, not good enough to make it onto the list, but I do think that it's a shame we didn't see more of him because mm. I think if we'd have had an overall better movie, I think he would have really, like Sean, if we'd have given him the opportunity to, I think it was a really good casting mm. um, for that kind of older kind of beast, which is how Beast is in a lot of uh, stuff. We don't usually see the young version of him. Um, so, yeah, it's those two. Good. Um, I have just rejigged my list slightly, and it's mainly <laughs> off, and this might be the first time this has happened, always a little rant about Matthew Lillard and Scooby-Doo. Um, but you conceded it's a good film, and therefore... Well, this is the th- I've, I've always <laughs> considered it a good film, and then because it came up on a lot of them lists, it, it made my list. Mm. But then it made my list to the point where it was currently, as I was looking at my notebook, sat at number four. And I thought, well, realistically, I like that film. Yeah. And I don't want to say it's a bad film, but like, yeah, he's great as Shaggy, you know, like he just, he just does exactly what he sets out to do. Like another one for that was my kind of inspiration. Because initially, I think I had an idea that I sent to Adam of um actors, like the the initial idea for this, and it has evolved, and I'm glad it's evolved this way, was actors who went harder than they needed to yeah. for a role. And Matthew Lillard would probably be top of everyone, near top of everyone's list for that. Because my inspiration for that was Michael Caine uh, in Muppet's Christmas Carol. Just, the, you know, it's clearly like, okay, Michael, so we're doing Christmas Carol, but you're up against Muppet, so it's going to be a bit of a laugh. Michael Caine treats it as seriously as a car crash. And it's <laughs> unbelievable. Like, <laughs> it's just, oh, my God. <laughs> Like, name a better Ebenezer Scrooge. I will sit here patiently and wait. He's fantastic. Uh, My actual honourable mentions are Adam Driver in Rise of Skywalker. That is my least favourite film of all time. And he is still doing what he can in that film. And uh, I am informed uh, that Kylo Ren is hot. Uh, Georgia has informed me that Kylo Ren is hot. That was surprising to me. I didn't think... That was a th- and it was one of those things, you know, the actor isn't hot, the character is mm. hot. So, I, so I I'm I'm sorry. What? Is that Adam thermistic- Driver isn't hot? <sighs> I remember someone It's the describing- high waisted pants, isn't it? That's what it I, is. I remember <laughs> someone describing it. Oh, maybe you'll agree with it. And I I think this is really perfect for Adam Driver. It's like he's handsome. Wait, is he handsome? Well, like, you'll see him in one angle, and it'll be it's like the oh, same God, no. as the Benedict Cumberbatch thing. Yes, you'll see him at one angle, and you'll be like, "Dear God, yeah. no!" And then I remember seeing his like... face. Benedict, I remember seeing Benedict Cumberbatch for the first time and thinking, "How is this guy an actor?" Where is and then you see him from like... another angle. It's like, There's "Oh a... my God, yes!" But for hey... about a year, there was a very, very funny running joke on last week with John Oliver, yeah. um, where he uh, used inappropriate language to describe adam driver and if you haven't seen the supercut of that on youtube do yourself a favor <laughs> and um, look it up another shout is billy burke in the twilight franchise yes as charlie swan charlie yeah. charlie swan is shining light in a terrible franchise he's the only person and michael sheen to be fair <laughs> okay he's a different kind of shining light he's just like michael sheen just gets that it's a dumb franchise so he just treats it like a dumb franchise, where like it's the comparison of Michael Caine in a Muppets film versus Tim Curry in a Muppets film. So Michael Caine treated the Muppets like actual actors, which is what Billy Burke does. Um, Michael Sheen just acts as one of the Muppets, like Tim Curry does in Treasure Island. He just pretends he's a Muppet, and like both performances are great as a result of it. But yeah, um, I do, and I just like. He's the only character I like, and maybe that's part of his writing, but Billy Burke is just so earnest, and like he's the only person who acts like a person, and it's just quite refreshing to see. He's um, such an underrated actor, I think. I think yeah, because I watched really underrated Drive actor, Angry a while back, and that's also, it's not on my list now, I think about it, and mm. that's also a pretty bad film. It's one of those yeah. Nicholas Cage films where it's like, <laughs> it is what it is, but he and that is genuinely quite unhinged. Yeah. Nicholas Cage um, could probably fill this list by himself. I've not got a single Nicholas Cage performance, <laughs> unfortunately. But... It's because, like, you don't know whether it's good or not with Nicholas Cage. Yeah. 
You never know. You're just not <laughs> sure. Um, my controversial pick, because it's be- because it became shame about the film, is Andrew Garfield in the Amazing Spider-Man franchise. Now, you know what I mean there, Adam. Yeah. His yeah. performance deserved to be unequivocally the the go-to Spider-Man, the definitive mm-hmm. Spider-Man. And it isn't. And it, it like the films, we like the films. They are a bit of a mess. Yeah. They are a bit of a mess. So that's why I, that's why I've got him in honorable mentions because everything in my top 10 is unequivocal dross. Like some of it is so bad you love it, but it is dross. Whereas like the amazing Spider-Man, there are plenty of like genuinely great filmmaking moments in it. Mm-hmm. And there's plenty of moments we think that's the best of that thing we've ever seen in a Spider-Man film to this day, despite Marvel being able to spend unlimited money on it. Like him swinging through the city is still the best we've ever seen it in Amazing Spider-Man 2. But just studio interference and sometimes very ugly film. Yeah. Right. Right, well, I'm going to kick us off on my number 10. Um, and it, Mainly because and I'm glad that Ollie mentioned the thing about Matthew Lillard because it made me think about somebody else who had not put on the list and now they've made their way up on the list. This number 10 was very much a kind of like, I need a number 10. I need something to fill out the list. And I was going through my letterbox and I was going through like all the films that I'd given bad ratings to and then I ended up getting to the three star films and I looked at this film and I thought, I didn't like this film. I gave it three stars because I can't deny that it's a well-made film. But the, the central performance in it is obviously very, very good. So my number 10 is Daniel Day-Lewis as Lincoln. Because Mm. Lincoln is so long and so podding and so like, ugh, ugh. And it easily could have gone to Sally Field, to be honest, in Lincoln as well, because she's great in it as well. But you can't deny the film is a well-made film. Just for me, it ain't for me. Like, Mm. I struggle with period stuff as it is. Um, and that was the year that I chose to try and watch all of the films that were nominated for Best Picture. Um, so like I went through a more and all that kind of stuff. It was the Django year as well. So I mean, Django was fine. Um, but Not really, period drama in Django. No, no. <laughs> but like this was just I, I just thought I'm never ever same way I, I felt with um twelve years twelve years a slave. But I enjoyed twelve years a slave more. I thought I'm never ever going to watch this film again. Um, but yeah, Daniel Day Lewis, I can't deny him in that. So that's a sort of like pithy first out of the gate pick just to get the top ten rolling. Um, <laughs> Holly, your number ten. I've included this one for you, Adam and Ollie, because you're both such screwedly doos. It's Yay. Eli, Eli yes! Wallach as Arthur in the Holiday. Um, so Michael, we. I've spoken to Adam and Ollie about how I really don't like The Holiday in another podcast that we did, but these two both like it. Although I think, Ollie, you admit it's the best film you, it's it, the worst film that you like. It's the worst film I love. Like it is no. terrible and I love it. There you go. <laughs> um, so I've, I've seen a lot of rom coms. Like I was a teenager in the noughties, I've seen every noughties rom com. For sure. And so I have rom-com fatigue. Um, And, you know, a really good rom-com is hard to find and is wonderful to watch. A really bad one can also be very fun to watch. But a mediocre one is a stain upon humanity. Yes. And The Holiday Mm -hmm. is a mediocre one because there are bits that are good. Like you said, Rufus Sewell, great villain for a rom-com, really good. And he is acting really well. But the bright spot in that film for me is that it shouldn't have been a rom-com it should have been a buddy com and it should have been Eli Wallach and Kate Winslet taking the center stage because Mm -hmm. every scene that they're in together sparkles he's so charismatic he's so lovely their friendship is so genuine and heartwarming I enjoyed every scene that he was in um, and really didn't enjoy any scene he wasn't in um, so he he absolutely made the film watchable for me. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think I've ever seen anything else that he's been in. Um, 
but I the good, the bad, and the ugly. I haven't seen it. <laughs> Westerns is a, just a big gap in yeah. like film. <laughs> Yeah, I just no in the middle of Holly there. talking about him there, I was just remembering him walking into the theatre and his surprised little face when everyone claps, and I wanted to cry because it's just yeah. it's so they're sweet. all there for him. They're all there for him. He thinks that no one cares about him, and he's just beloved. And he makes his own way up the stairs because he's been practicing because Kate made him practice. Oh, yeah. God damn it! He's it's oh. the only it's the only relationship that feels genuine in the whole film. Yeah. I believe that they're friends. Mm, yeah. Shout. Uh, Michael, number 10. Yeah, so the one I've picked, some people like this film. I don't know if anyone in, in this particular group does, but I, some people do like this film. And I think it could have been amazing, but it was just poorly executed and it's class. Mm. Um, now, the weird thing is, almost everyone gives a pretty good performance of what they're given. Uh, apart from Bruce Willis, but I think his character is supposed to be a bit wooden. I don't know. Would that not have been the beginning of his decline with health as well, maybe? Yeah, it absolutely could have been, yeah. But I do think the character's written poorly as well. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. We can, we know that now and we can attribute to that, absolutely. But the original Unbreakable, he was very similar. And yeah. That's many years early. The character wasn't very good. Um, but Glass himself, Samuel Jackson's character was still quite good. He kind of brought that... When we saw him become at the very end of Unbreakable, he was paid off here in what was a really disappointing film that could have been so, so good. He still shone. Uh, and like I say, almost... It's, it's actually incredible that it's still a bad film when you consider that everyone actually is doing a pretty good job. Uh, but I think he's... set the director. <laughs> yeah, and, and probably this. I mean, it's obviously not just the day, it's probably the script writers and everything as well, but still M. Night Shyamalan, yeah. isn't it? Like, I'm pretty sure you're about the script as well. Yeah, yeah, I just think it was just so long, and then the payoff just wasn't there. But for him, it was. He was exactly all your expectations of him, what he would be like when he came back, when met. Um, and yeah, I just think he, he did a really good job of it. I, I mean, Samuel Jackson's pretty much good in everything, isn't it? Um, yeah. But I think he, in that one, he really had the opportunity to stand out because usually he's got a good cast around him as well. Whereas in this instance, it was a good cast, but the, it was just a crap story. Because I've still not seen Glass because I've seen Unbreakable and I've seen Split. And the thing that surprised me about the lists that when Holly sent a couple through and then I went and, uh, like Holly said before, like he fell into a hole with it. A lot of people were saying James McAvoy for Split. And I didn't think Split was a bad film. Like mm. I think I, I think, think Split's a bad film. I think I he's think very Split's good fine. in it. Mm. I didn't think it was a bad film, you know. Um <clears throat> Yeah, I enjoyed Split. But then he is the whole film pretty much. Yeah. So the entire film is him and the eight or so characters he plays. Yeah. And yeah, there's the, the three girls who are in it, and only one of them really does anything. Isn't one of them but, a um, young Anya Taylor Joy yeah. as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well she's in glass as well, isn't she? Same character. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, uh, and she does a good job in both of them as well. Yeah. Oi, Oliver, number ten. Uh, for my number ten, um, we are in uh, the Harry Potter universe. Uh, my favorite. It just felt like a real breath of fresh air, and it still remains this. My favorite um, kind of a Wizarding World film, if you like, is Fantastic Beasts. Just something about it not relying on a book other than a fake compendium of knowledge of these magical creatures and building quite a tight narrative around that. Um, I just loved it. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. So I was hyped for the sequel, Crimes of Grindelwald. And Crimes of Grindelwald was just a mess. It really felt like the plot was trying to do too many things. It didn't dedicate enough time to any one of them. Um, so it, the tone was a bit all over the place, uh, but my shining light throughout them, I could have gone for Dan Fogler because I do really love Jacob. I think Jacob is such a great character. I love his little piano theme in the first one. I love that he opens his little bakery with you know, all the creatures, but Eddie Redmayne's characterization as Newt Scamander just doesn't miss a beat. 
He's still phenomenal in that. And I do think the third film picks up slightly because the plot's just a bit tighter. I don't like that Newt Scamander is just this kind of go-to save-the-world wizard rather than just a magic zoologist who, like, uses his knowledge and is in the right place at the right time. Um, and it does seem to get away from that a bit, but, like, his performance is just so endearing. It's so vulnerable. Um... And it's just adorable. Like, every time he's on the screen, I just want to, like, hold him gently, like Voldemort holds Draco awkwardly and gently. Well done, Draco. I just want to give him a little hold and just be like, it's new, it's going to be okay. All, all, all the silly magical creatures, you can keep them safe. It's going to be great, mate. Don't worry. Don't worry. But, like, the rest of that film was just, like, it, it threw lots of different plot elements. Like, like I can't really explain what happened in it other than Grindelwald got out and then stole Queenie. Like, I can't really remember how magical creatures were involved in it. So it just felt like new going on an adventure like Harry Potter would have done, but he's a magic zoologist. Why is he not focusing on that still? Um, but yeah, I, th I love him in um, all three of the films that we've had thus far. Nice. So yeah. What, one, of my one of my favourite um, YouTube channels, aside from Farrandon Film, is called Pop Culture um, Detective. And um, he focuses on um, masculinity in media. And he has an excellent video about Newt Scamander um, mm. and those films. And I highly recommend it because um, it made me look at the film very differently. And I like that character a lot more. Interesting. He's a, he, um, he's a, he's a man's man, but he's not toxic. Yeah. It is uh, like a different version of what masculinity can be, which is very positive. Mm. Nice. Uh, Holly, your number nine. My number nine. Um, okay, uh, this is a bit shameful to say, perhaps. Like, the film that you first saw twice in the cinema. Like, it was so good, you had to go back and see it again. <laughs> now, the first film that I saw twice in the cinema was not because it was so good, I had to see it again. It was because I was in the uh, movie uh, club at Odeon and you, it was one pound tickets on a Saturday morning. So I'd already seen this film, but this was the film that was showing on movie club. So I went again and it was uh, George of the Jungle um, and uh, Brendan Fraser in George of the Jungle is just excellent. I I'm not having that as a bad film, Holly. I'm sorry. I, this is what I was, was thinking. I'll be I honest. Was having George of the Jungle as no. a bad film. It was cri it was critically panned, and right. it hasn't had any kind of uh, life after its its release. Like it's not now thought of as a great kids film, is it? Have you gone it's back not and watched brought it? Though? up. Uh, no, I haven't. I only it is, watched it those two times. It was genuine. It's one of those that was just ahead of it. It's like Rocky and Bullwinkle. People talk about Rocky and Bullwinkle like it was a really terrible film. It was just really good at lampoon. Like people thought it was trying to be sincere, and yeah. therefore it was terrible. Whereas it was taking the mick out of itself. I don't get me wrong. I enjoyed it. Was it. Great. So we, we've it's all like taken. We've all taken different approaches to what shame about the film means. And my list is a mixture of, I didn't like the film. The film was critically panned, but I actually liked it. Or mm. the film was just a kind of three star mare situation. I liked George of the Jungle, but it's not considered a classic. I think we yeah. can agree that. And, um, and Brendan Fraser is excellent. In he's it. amazing <laughs> in it. He's absolutely brilliant. Him and the voiceover guy. Don't know who did the yes. voiceover, but the voiceover was a character of its own. Um, and it was very important to how funny the film was. Um, but yeah, it, it really showcased, I think, how uh, likable Brendan Fraser is when he, whichever character he's playing, he just has an affability that shines through. Um, and I haven't really enjoyed any other Tarzan um, type films. Um, I didn't enjoy the one with... Um, What's his face, Skarsgård, and I, I didn't like the Disney one either. I'm afraid, although I know we disagree mm. on that ad. And, <laughs> and Ollie, apparently, um, I don't hate it. I just think it's mid tier Disney. I kind of love the Skarsgård one as well. It's so just yeah. needlessly dark and gritty. Um, 
it. <laughs> I but, love it. Um, George, George of the Jungle is the only iteration of that character that I, I like. Um, and I think that's all Brendan Fraser, to be quite honest. Yeah. Oh. I am fuming that we're not going to get to see it. Was it Firefly he was going to play in the cancelled Batman Girl? Yes. Oh. Yeah. He, I, I'm genuinely rage filled that we're not going to get to see that because some exec made a decision about bloody insurance. But it's this is that it's done. It's sat on someone's hard drive. I um, want someone to like. Can we have a Toy Story I, two story, please? Yeah. <laughs> can we have I want, someone coming yeah, back? I want, from some, I want someone to have Warner Brothers and just release it. Yeah. Uh, Michael, you're number nine. Uh, number nine. I'm gonna mess this name up, and I apologize. Is it Liv Liv Schreiber? Yeah, uh, Liv Schreiber. Liv. Oh, that's, I, I'm really bad at this. Right. Um. Obviously, as Sabretooth, it, is it, it was Origins, wasn't it? Yeah. It was um, and I think in that film, Hugh does a good job, but he's playing an already established character. Probably one of the worst iterations of that already established character as well. Mm. And we're kind of attaching the fact we already like him. Reynolds does a decent job the first time we see him. Re, obviously, we don't talk about the end of the film. But I think for the whole thing, like Sabretooth is a force in that film mm. and all, and even like we're told multiple times that Wolverine is superior to him he is told to his face that Wolverine is superior to him and he does not believe it and we kind of don't yeah even though we're like Wolverine is awesome we're kind of like no he's gonna I don't actually see how Wolverine even with his metal claws and then when we see him win and we're kind of like I don't know if I buy that because he's just so menacing he's just this big beast like he's is exactly what you want Sabretooth to be. Just this beast of a man who's just like rage in human form. And he just wants to be the best. Mm, he just wants to, and yeah. he just he just plays that role so well. And it is a car crash film for so many reasons. And I think there's so many bad, like say, Hugh Jackman's playing probably the worst version of Wolverine he's played. Though they're all much or muchness, to be fair. He's good at that role, but that's not the best one. Um, like I say, the only other standout is probably those few minutes of Reynolds where we kind of saw modern day Daredevil for a few minutes. Uh, yeah, you know, in like the elevator, as he comes out of the elevator, we have that scene and mm. we have a little bit of it. Uh, but then, like, you've got Will I Am being absolutely terrible. Awful. Um, Gam the guy who played Gambit. I don't oh, know, Taylor Kirsch. Sure. He was kind of fun. Yeah, he, but he was just having fun with it, wasn't he? He wasn't like, that wasn't Why an amazing Adam portrayal. Hiding? <laughs> Does Adam like uh, Origins? No, it's that's gonna, it, that's that his, person's going to be on that's the That's his number later. one. Taylor Kirch. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise. But I don't know, I'm not saying that's bad, but it wasn't, for me, it wasn't like a completely different level than the rest of the movie. Like mm. his portrayal of Subity feels like it's a completely different film. His scenes feel like a completely different film. Yeah. He's, he's bringing it. I love the, the one unequivocally good bit of that film is that montage of them fighting through history. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Sabretooth yeah, yeah. just getting more and more brutal and like Wolverine having to like hold him back and like they get shot by the firing squad and stuff like that. Like that's a great moment. And then the film just dies. <laughs> like almost immediately. He completely blows Tyler Main's performance out of the water from the mm. first one. From the first Tyler Mains, is he, is yeah, he although a wrestler, he looked Tyler more Mains. like Sabretooth. He does look more like him. I think he was a trainee wrestler because they did that thing of just getting someone with like a big stocky frame to do yeah. it. But he's he's not a well-known wrestler. I think he, he wasn't given a lot to do, to be fair, Tyler May, whereas Shreba was like kind of the heart and soul. Oh, of yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Like... <laughs> A um, terrible film, but he did. Yeah, he did. I've heard as well. Um, as a side note, he's one of the people being rumored to be approached to replace Ray Stevenson in Ahsoka as Balin Skull. Oh, okay. I would love that. I think he'd do a really good job of mm. kind of keeping it on and like looking a bit different. And you could ex you could either explain it away or just nah, he's the same bloke. What you're talking about? <laughs> if, you talk, <laughs> if you want to talk about him, I see him in a good film. Him in Spotlight. Ooh. Oh, Jesus. Uh, he's phenomenal. <laughs> uh, Oliver, you're number nine. Um, we are coming on. We've got another Shyamalan property. Oh, Shyamalan. Do 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 do. Uh, we've got a property. I don't know why he's touching because it, it strikes me that he was just a fan of it because it is his uh, live action rendition of The Last Airbender, 
which is a show I've talked about to death. I cannot stress it enough. I'm going to say it again. If you haven't seen it, go and watch it. I'm pretty sure it's all on Netflix. Um, the live action adaptation looks really good uh, so far. The new one that Netflix is developing, oh, the I think. <laughs> yeah, the new the new one. Yeah, with like Daniel Day Kim uh, is the only name I recognize. Uh, Paul Seung Lu, who plays you know that captain in the um, Rebel fleet in all the Star Wars sequel series. That's like oh, the, yeah, old, yeah. the elder, yeah. like he's um, he's he's going to be in it as well. So those two, I'm really looking forward to. It. But um, yeah, just garbage film. Completely does a disservice to the characters and the story of the original source material. Um, it's one of those things. Like unless you're kind of adapting it for a new audience years down the line, which is what this new live action series clip I think is looking to do. Like, this wasn't long done at this point. The characters are completely different. So Stocker, who's in it, he is, like, the elder kid in the in our main trio, and he's he's kind of... he's He shows, like, leadership qualities, but also he's, like, the Joker. He's the comic relief a lot of the time. And he's just such a serious sourpuss in the film, and he t constantly talks about the death that has been brought to his family. It's like Stocker, lighten up. You're the one that's meant to be like making us feel happy in this like horrific situation. But an absolute shining beacon in this film is Dev Patel. Dev Patel as Zuko, I think I've mentioned it before. I really cannot fault his performance. He's not given a good script by any means. He's clearly being given like pretty lackluster direction, but he is a fan and you can tell he's a fan of The Last Airbender because some of the acting decisions he has made are clearly his own and it sh and he's really, really good as Zuko. He shows a lot of emotions because Zuko is one of the most compelling characters made for kids ever because this is fundamentally a kid series and Zuko is such a complicated character and Dev Patel does such a good job of getting all of that across when, you know, because people love Dante Basco of uh, Hook fame. Rufio is uh, um, this same guy. Yeah, Rufio, Rufio. He does the voice for him in this series. And this is, like, I think more people show him love at, like, uh, conventions for Zuko than they do for Rufio now. Like, because it was just such a great performance from him. And Dev Patel really does it justice. Um, he's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, there are shout outs as well to um, the guy who played Yinsen in the original um, Iron Man. He plays his uncle in this and their relationship is like really sweet. They capture that really well. The problem is that these are the villains and they shouldn't be the most likable people in the film. Because <laughs> like, Iroh's one of the most likable people in the show though, to be fair. True, but true. But like it's a different vibe, and Iro, it's because the movie, the movie, I'm not defending the movie at all. Oh yeah, I know, I know. But <laughs> a because the show had Mako voicing him for God's sake, which is always going to be a winner. Uh, but B, he was the voice. He wasn't a villain. He was he was nominally a villain, but you very quickly realise he's just trying to keep Zuko on the right track, and he even tries to stop him when he tries to go too far. Um, but Dev Patel, you could tell if he was given more time to kind of do it, he would be a fantastic live action Zuko in a better film. This film did not, he did this film. And like, there's a clip of him like apologizing for how bad the film was at the premiere but when he was like signing autographs, which, which I love. <laughs> like, he basically, uh, yeah, sorry about the film. <laughs> like, he's clearly annoyed by it. Um, noise, right. My number nine. You've probably not heard of the film. You might have heard of the person that I'm going to talk about. Um, there's a film released in 2022 called Tomorrow Morning, right? Which is based on a musical, which I had no idea existed. Um, but it was one of these films that fell into my inbox and said, do you want to give a review? Do you want to have a look at it? And I was like, yeah, of course I do. And the person that I picked is Samantha Barks because she out acts and outperforms every single person in that film because that film is bad. Um <laughs> now it's I can't even remember any of the songs from it. It's not memorable at all. It's very televisual. It just looks like a TV version of 
this thing that they've done. There's cameos left, right and centre. I don't know who produced it and who basically just rang the friends up and said, can you come in? Because you've got Fleur East in it at one point, right? You've then got Joan Collins in it. Like, who's rang all these people to get all these people in? But Samantha Barks is just fantastic in it. And that would be no surprise to anyone who knows anything about Samantha Barks. Mm-hmm. Um, so she was is Eponine in Les Mis in the film version. Um, and she's recently been on TV being a judge on Mamma Mia, I Have a Dream. But she's currently Elsa in Frozen on the West she End. She was Elsa there for a bit as well, wasn't she? She was out, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Oh no, I don't think she was. No, she wasn't. She's not. Done she's with not the alphabet. No, she'd be a very, very good alphabet. <laughs> she would. Um, but um, we saw her when we went to London to uh, set Ruby to watch Wicked. We saw her in uh, not Wicked, in Frozen, and she was fantastic in that. And she's fantastic in this film. It's just the rest of the film is naff. It's proper bargain bin. Like Morrison's two quid is a DVD that's sealed. Let's pick it up because it says it's a musical naffness but she's better than everything. So the beauty of this now is, like, I don't know this, and I'm going to speak for Michael and Holly and say they don't know this film either, but now we have no compunction, com- conviction to go and see it. Because yeah. it's just like, well, Samantha Barks is going to date. It's like, all right, let's find her bits on YouTube. At Pretty worst. much it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is why you wanted to be positive all those seconds. It was like, oh, go and watch this film. You've not seen this performance, have you? You've not yeah. seen this horror movie, have you? It's really good. <laughs> Well, oh, this is about Avatar yet, though. So, sure. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I took Amy through my list yesterday, and Amy knows that like Samantha Bax is my sort of what's what's that word of who's Your the whole one? pass? The whole pass, yeah. <laughs> and um, Amy's aware. So, as soon as I said Samantha Bax, she was like, Of course, <laughs> it's just an excuse. <laughs> um, but yeah, <laughs> Michael, number eight, uh, number eight. So, I enjoyed this movie a lot. Because I know to switch my brain off when I watch these films, um, but it's Fast X, which they've just become more ridiculous. I, I really enjoy the Fast series, and I actually really enjoy how ridiculous they're becoming. Because again, you just switch your brain off. But Jason Momoa as Dante was just somewhat totally new, and it's weird because he kind of. I mean, I don't like the backstory of. He was always there in the background. I don't like that. That's annoying. Um, but he's just so like flamboyant and totally the opposite of of the people like Vin Diesel. His crew of like super special secret agent ex car thieves slash you know stereo thieves. You know what I mean? They're all like hard people, and he's just this like flamboyant yet really capable. I don't know, just this like force throughout the mm. film. And he's, and he doesn't really seem to care. And then sometimes he gets really angry and does care. And then all of a sudden he don't care anymore again. It's just such a bizarre, unhinged performance that's just <laughs> a joy to watch. I've seen he's a really charming performer, though, isn't he? Like yeah. I remember because I he watched. Is, no, he is himself really good. Yeah, yeah. I watched general. June recently, and he almost fell out of place in June. But he weird, was. He was really necessary in June, like having someone to really care about like that, because I do rate Timothy Chalamet as an actor, but he is one of the, like his acting style is look dead inside for most of your screen time. Hey, <laughs> seriously, go and watch Wonka. <sighs> I've heard of Wonka. Wonka. I don't know who asked for that film. It surprised me. Like I went in thinking this is going to be naff and... I quite like the soundtrack. Like, because I, I wanted, to, I wanted to give it now. kudos because I know it's made by the guys who made Paddington, and the Paddington yeah. films are so much better than they have any right to be. And the but... mighty boosh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> going back to my more in Fast X though, I'd read stuff like pantomime villain, like he's just hamming it up, he's doing all this kind of stuff, and there was a video of him. He can't, he's coming out of like I don't know, it might be a house. Um, and he's about to go into a car and he does some sort of weird leap. And then there's like a really odd, odd, like Foley audio that's just been added in of him going, Wee! <laughs> <laughs> What's that about? And it, but it, it just works. He just works in that. I, I almost feel like, had that film had a really serious villain, it yeah. would have been a West film. Like, had they just had someone who, like, you know, like some of the others, they've had the like cartel boss. 
who like was a bit of a more serious villain, though the fact that they were getting street racers to deal with him was the unhinged bit. Um, but no, he's, he's just so good. It's so, and it, because obviously he's the guy who's kind of next spoilers, I guess, working with him at the end, which is the guy from the Reacher series. I forget his name. Absolute mountain of a man. He plays Reacher in the TV. Oh, series. Alan Richton. Alan, Alan Richton. Richton. Had yeah. he been the main antagonist and just him, I don't think that film would have been anywhere near as good as it was. And he's not bad, don't get me wrong. He's a very traditional fast villain. Even the enemy, friend, back to enemy again. He's very, very traditional for them, like the role he plays. But them kind of playing off against each other and also not liking each other very much. And it just it just works so well. Yeah, mm. I just really enjoyed that. I mean excited for the next one. I'm excited to see if he ends up in any of the spin-offs as well, like The Rock and stuff. That are all kind of I don't know if they're still just rumors. Uh, but I think they'll be really good as well. Uh Oliver, number eight. Oh. Okay, so Holly. The year is I want to say 2014. We have just come off the back of you don't rate it as highly, but we have just come off the back of one of the most critically acclaimed Bond films ever in uh, Skyfall. Mm -hmm. And we get the title of the next Bond film. And we're excited. Of Spectre. And we are hyped because there's been this horrific rights battle, a background for anyone who cares. There's been this horrific rights battle ever since uh, one of the original producers left around Sean Connery's time as to who gets the rights to Spectre. Um, uh, Eon very unceremoniously killed off, definitely not Ernst Stavro Blofeld by dropping him down a chimney shack in the, at the beginning of Fior Eyes Only. Uh, but they've got the rights to Spectre back. And you've got, in the cast lineup as they're announcing it, you've got James Bond, Naomi Harris, you've got a returning Judy Dench, um, Christoph Fultz. And everyone who knew anything about Bond at that point knew that Christoph Waltz was going to play Ernst Stavro Blofeld. And he is as excellent in this film as he possibly can be. Because, my God, what an awful Bond film. It might be my second least favourite. Genuinely, it was so bad. It it's was... worse because of the potential. Like there are worse Bond films, but this one feels worse because the potential for it to be so much missed opportunity. You get Christoph Waltz. As there was literally no better casting that you could have had because this was off the back of uh, Inglorious, off the back of Django, two powerhouse performances. I think both of which might have won him an Oscar. I think he won an Oscar for both. So you've got a double award-winning Oscar performance guy as the perfect, like he was born to play it. But they went for this stupid thing of, uh, oh no, he he's not playing uh, Blofeld, he's playing Franz Oberhalmer. And yeah, he's a different character. Like that stupid thing they did with Benedict Cumberbatch in Into Darkness. No, he's not Khan. Well, he is. Harrison. He pat- yeah, he patently is Khan to anyone with a brain cell. Like, everyone knows who he is. I don't know why you're trying to have this as a rug pull moment for us. And just that slows down the pace of the story because it just causes this unnecessary thing. And then it's like, oh, we see the cat. And it's called Spectre. So you're not going to not have Blofeld in it. And the weird retconning where it was like, because they didn't have Spectre, they had Quantum and they had Raul Silver. They tried to be like, oh, but Spectre was behind it all in like some weird throwaway line. Um, the shining lights in this film, as mentioned, Christoph Waltz, with the terrible script he is given, he is excellent. He's everything I'd hoped Blofeld would be other than the fact that they've given him these personal stakes with James Bond, which I hate when they do that unnecessarily. Yeah. Like, he, they did it with Moriarty in the BBC Sherlock series. They made that a Batman-Joker relationship. No, it should be the classic Moriarty is this criminal mastermind and respects his Sherlock Holmes, his James Bond, but they are opposing each other. And fundamentally, that is why they clash. And 
he looks great in it. He sounds great in it. Um, the only other shining light is Batista. Um, he's hilarious. I love the train fight. That is actually a really good fight. The fact that they don't play any music in it. Um, but yeah, and he's just done so dirty in this film and the next. He is done quite dirty in No Time to Die. And I much prefer No Time to Die. Uh, I just feel like No Time to Die was having to clean up a lot of the mess that Spectre made so it couldn't really flourish as well as it could have done as a film. But Christoph Waltz, he feels wasted now. Like, we're not going to get this. We are never going to see him be a great Blofeld, which feels a real shame because he, he, like, you asked me for dream casting of that role and I'd pick him. I'm going to go back and watch Spectre again. I might need to, but it is just like there's lots of individually good moments, but the story is so. I think I've only seen it all the way through twice once in the cinema and then once when it was on Blu ray or whatever. Mm. And like, obviously, I teach Skyfall, so I watched that once a year. Mm. And No Time to Die, I did again over Christmas. I didn't intend to, it was just it was on ITV One on like New Year's Eve, and I was like, yeah, I'll watch this. Um, and I think they're both fantastic. And I've always thought that you two were a bit harsh on Spectre, but I might go back and just see if it is that I was just rose tinted glasses at that point. For Holly reason. said it though. I think it was. We we hear the title Spectre. We hear that Christoph Waltz has been cast, and we know it's a Stavro Blofeld. In the same way that when Arkham uh, when Arkham Knight came out, everyone knew that the Arkham Knight was Jason Todd. Everyone knew. Uh, and they tried backpedaling, and it was just pointless. Just be like, all right, yeah, he's Blofeld. Yeah, yeah. Because imagine the hype that generates, and like not trying to write some story where it's like Franz Oberhaus and making these weird personal states. But I think we we just lament the film that could have been from this. Because with the cast they got, with Leah Seydoux, with Batista, with Chris, uh, Christoph Waltz, it felt you could see the makings of like a classic Bond cast. You could see the big henchman, you could see the big bad villain, you could see the Bond girl, and Le- Leah Sado ends up doing a terrible job in the films, actually, I'm not going to lie, but she's a very accomplished actress, and I had hopes that she'd be really good, but just, this, it, it, it felt very joyless, this film, nobody seemed to be enjoying themselves in this film, whereas at least in the next film, like, Daniel Craig's enjoying it a lot more, because he's like, I'm finally going to die, I'm finally done with this. Lashana Lynch is great in the next film as well. And Rami Malek is just weird. He's just a weird guy anyway, so I think he's enjoying himself. Um, but yeah, like, it just, we lament the film that could have been. We we thought it would be this hearkening back to, like, Goldfinger and Thunderball. Um, and to a lesser extent, You Only Live Twice, because that's just a, a classic Spectre-driven story. And it just wasn't. It was just this weird, I want to get revenge on you. Um, I, I've just shuffled to my mind round a little bit because I think it makes more sense to talk about this person now and maybe I was getting a little bit too pinned down by how much I love the character um, but I very specifically chose a t-shirt to wear today <laughs> um, there's Gambit for those of you on YouTube um, so I'm going back to Origins now I, I love the character Gambit right and when they announced that it was going to be in Origins, I was like, well, this is better to be good. And to be fair, I don't think Taylor Kitsch does a bad job. I think it's absolutely fine. He don't do a good one either. <laughs> I think it's fine. I think it's fine, right? But for for all the nonsense that's going on in that film, I think he and Lee Schreiber are the two standouts in it, right? I think, obviously, you've got Ryan Reynolds as well, but I think that they end up retconning that. Later mm. on, you know, oh, yeah, that's why... just shoots him in the head. It's hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> um, but there was just something about the way that they, you know, they, they they leaned into the sort of Louisiana, the sort of French Canadian style, all that kind of stuff. They leaned into all that, the Rem and LeBeau, everything, and it worked. And I was hoping to see more, to be honest. And then they keep talking about this Channing Tatum version. Whether that's going to happen or not, God that'd knows. That would be great. Challenge Tatum would be a great team. Like, um, Gambit. It's like, what are they doing? Can we just have a serious thing for Gambit, please? Just it what? is weird, to be fair, that he's never made an appearance in like any other X Men film. Like, he's a really popular character. Yeah, people has love him. Been in any of the Jubilee technically has, but not in a sort of oh my god, this is Jubilee. Mm. In the, like, they, they were my two favorites. As in passing, the, in the yeah. cartoon. 
some like there's there's been a character. I think it's they went gone. with a young rogue. Yeah, you yeah. can't really have Gambit without also having the older rogue because it was the the way they bounce off each other really yeah. made those characters. And yeah. it was a bad choice because I mean, no hate on what she tried to do, but she wasn't a great rogue. Um, and I think it's just because Rogue at that age isn't an interesting character. Rogue being young and struggling with her powers is a boring character. It's interesting with the first one when you look back on it because you you think about some of the characters that got cast. So you've got like Wolverine, Hugh Jackman, not really known at that time. Should have been Doug Ray Scott, but you know went yeah, over on Mission Impossible. That would have been terrible. Weird. <laughs> um, James Mars and the Cyclops again, not really well known. But then you look at like them casting someone like Anna Paquin, who's done a load of stuff as a child actor before that point, and it's like, are you going for name value over anything else than that? And you just I do think as well to be fair, player. like her being quite innocent was important to that story. Yeah, like she, she yeah, was, yeah. she was the MacGuffin ultimately. So she I think didn't have a clue important. that if she touched Wolverine, she was going to kill him. Yeah. You know? It is quite. I, I quite like her story, and I think that's one thing. Like a lot of like diehard comic book fans are annoyed because she's like this southern belle and she's dead confident. But yeah, like I like seeing her. I, I would have liked to see her grow into that. The problem is by the third film, she doesn't. And like if she had grown into that over the course of the three films, that would have been great. But she's still just this meek, pathetic little child throughout the whole thing, which yeah. is a shame. Yeah. Um, what yeah, happened so... to Taylor Kirch as well? Where's he's he gone? Still around, I think. Like he did, he did John Carter and Mars. He, he did, did one detective, season of True he? Detective, which yeah. was the was that was the season that everyone thought was terrible. I'm pretty sure. Um, because he was in season two, wasn't he? Yeah, so he was in he was in a film called Twenty One Bridges, which to be fair is a pretty good film. That's got Chadwick Boseman. Oh, is that the Chadwick Boseman yeah. one? Um, yeah. He's done a lot of TV stuff. So he was in a mini series called The Defeated, one called The Terminal List that's on Prime Video that's got Chris Pratt in it. Um and then a one called Painkiller that was on Netflix. Oh yeah, that's the one about um the Sacklers and the sort of farmer hmm. boom that happened. Yeah, he he plays quite a pivotal role in that. He's, he basically gets injured um and ends up taking painkillers and they give him this sort of new painkiller that they've come out with and he gets addicted and loses everything. He reminds me of Shane West. So yeah. remember someone I remember someone describing like a genre of Hollywood actor, a mainly actor. I don't think he made any, he gave any examples of women. There might be examples who are women, but there's like, um, there's a group of actors who are perfectly talented and they are good looking, but they're good looking in quite a boring way. So they, they never, they never really make it. So Shane West, like the biggest thing I think he's done is leave extraordinary gentlemen. And then he had a load of series on ER, but like, yeah. And he's a good actor, but like he never made it massive because he was just a bit boring looking. Mm, yeah. Like he didn't stand out um, in the way that like a Jason Momoa is quite strikingly good looking, or like Chris Pratt is quite goofily good looking. Like he's just like he's just very vanilla, boring, good looking. <laughs> As is Taylor Kirsch. <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. Um, shout. Holly, number eight. Um, back to the rom-coms again. There are quite a few. I'm very sorry. Um, and I'm cheating because I've got two people because they uh, fulfill the same usual role. So in a rom-com, you, you have the the main character, the love interest, and then the best friend. Um, and the best friend character is usually supposed to be comic relief. But I often find in a bad rom-com that they're very annoying. So they might be, if the main character is like jaded, then the best friend will be a romantic and try to like help them think, um, um, have hope about love again. And if it's the other way around, if the main character is a hopeless romantic, then the best friend will be really jaded. Um, and they're, they're often just a, a pretty boring stereotype um, and the actors portraying them Tend, tend to do a bad job, I find. Um, but in uh, Never Been Kissed, another noughties uh, rom-com, which is pretty rubbish now. Um, I watched it again and also as a, as a teacher, <laughs> f- 
full of red flags. Like that film is just a red flag now. I don't think I could watch it. Theme homes. Um, But uh, Molly Shannon and John C. Riley as the best friend duo who work (laughs) with Drew Barrymore's character are brilliant. They are very, very funny in a non-traditional best friend way. Um, And the two of them have a romantic spark, which evolves over the film. And that's the relationship I was invested in. The the teacher guy that she falls for is as vanilla as it is possible for a human (laughs) being to be. Like, it's just so, so boring. Um, And a bland, like, good-looking bloke, like, it, it, that actor is probably in the same blue yeah, list. Yeah, Taylor Kerr, Shane West. Um, yeah. Um, not not interested. Drew Barrymore is always like sparky and lovable and she doesn't do a bad job here, but it's forgettable. Um, but Molly Shannon and John C. Riley are both great and putting them together was a stroke of genius. They they save the film from being rubbish. And they Adam, it's elevate the daddy it one to... hour photo. Is the what? It's the dad from One Hour Photo. He is oh, blandly handsome. Right, Michael yeah. Varton. There you go. I'm just giving him a Google. <laughs> <laughs> Again, dodgy dodging that, any? Yeah, oh, I mean, smart, I mean, man. I mean, not illegally dodgy dodge, just no, immorally dodgy just, dodge. You know, dodgy dodge. Uh, right, <laughs> sevens, Oliver. Uh, my number seven. We're in the Disney films. Oh. This one appeal. This one uh, occurred to me quite late in the game. Actually, I had to look over um, other lists because I think I had like seven or eight, and this one jumped out at me. Um, as what I said, it's not my least favorite Disney film because my least favorite Disney film makes Adam and uh, Polly's blood boil, but uh, it is the worst. I think it's a somewhat interesting failure, but it is a failure of a film, and it is Black Cauldron. Um, if you haven't seen Black Cauldron, it is worth a watch just to see how low quality it got for Disney in terms of animation. Um, there is the potential for an interesting story with these elements, but Disney does not accomplish it. I don't think Disney is the right studio for this story, but... One performance which does really, really stand out is getting John Hurt as your goddamn villain. John Hurt as the Horned King in The Black Cauldron is just everything you want, kind of. He's he's the closest I've seen to, like, Sauron in film. It's how I imagine Sauron would speak, with that kind of slightly old-worldy fantasy style of speech. Everything he says is just dripping with evil. Like, if you were to get a voice for Sauron, I think John Hurt would be perfect, and this would be his audition piece. Um, It is worth watching for him. It is worth watching for his death. It remains the most brutal death in a Disney film because he gets the flesh basically ripped from his bones. It is a bloodless scene, but he does get the flesh ripped from his bones in a kid's film. A kid's film that, as I have said, was outperformed upon its release by a re-release of Care Bears. That's how badly this film did. This film nearly killed Disney. So that's how bad this film is. But his performance is great. Everyone out, like, there are some other good performances. Like, Nigel Hawthorne's in there. He's pretty funny. Although he's much better in Tarzan as Jane's dad. He's like one of the funniest comic relief characters in Tarzan of any Disney film. And I'll fight anyone on that. But he, John Hurt in this, he's just like, he's one of those actors like you think, yeah, he'd have been great as a Disney villain. He was. And it is worth watching just for that. But the rest of the film is awful. Oh, oi, oi. Right. Uh, my number seven. Um. It's the only film that I've ever felt the need to go in and edit myself. Um, so after this was released... No, um, I'm wondering who you're picking. I'm wondering, because I know the film. I'm yeah. wondering who you're picking. Um, oh, I'm picking the reason why I edited it. Um, okay, I think I know. I'm, I'm going with Ben Affleck. 
from Batman versus Superman Dawn of Justice. Okay. Um, now, when this was released, I went after it after it got released, and I, I could get a, a downloadable digital copy and all that kind of stuff. I went in and I edited out Superman up until he appears when Batman drives the Batmobile into him. Because then what that does is that creates a different narrative where it's a film about Batman trying to find Superman because he's this alien who's just created a load of nonsense around this city. And the first time he pops up is when Batman is at the docks and he's trying to find him and he drives off. And as he drives off, Superman's just up there. And so it, no Clark inst- Kent either? No. Right, okay. Yeah, and it just instantly creates a better film, in my view anyway. That, that think, makes sense, yeah. I think that's because Ben Affleck here was trying his hardest to get this Batman character off the ground. And I wanted to see more of Batfleck. I was mm. into it. I mean, for all the stuff that he's done since where he's he's popped up in Flash and he's popped up in Suicide Squad and, you know, the Justice League was obviously as naff as it was. But you can tell that he just wants to do more as Batman and he's not going to be able to. It's not going to happen. Um, mm. I was surprised when I watched Flash last year that he was actually in it as much as he was in it. Um, but then they do this, there's a weird twist at the end of Flash. Um, and yeah, but for this, like, I think everything else that's going on, I think Henry Cavill as Superman is fine, is passable, is all that kind of stuff. Um, Jesse Eisenberg's Lex, Lex Luthor is just him trying to Awful. outact everybody, Awful. you know. Trying yeah. to be the Joker. Yeah, yeah. He's trying and to be the just, Joker. I don't know why they didn't, especially at the time, I don't know why they didn't They didn't get, like, Brian Cranston. Can you imagine him as Lex Luthor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. unbelievable. And, like, the latest cat, James Gunn has announced that Nicholas Holt is going to be his Lex Luthor. Yes. I am hyped for that. Jesse yeah. Eisenberg was a poor choice on every level. And I tell you, I nearly went with for this. I nearly went with Jeremy Irons. Yeah, he's a really, he's a very he's underappreciated a, he's, Alfred. He's actually. a good Alfred. He's like, a very like, good Alfred. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Andy Serkis knocked him out of the park, but yeah. Yeah, but Andy Serkis is going to Andy Serkis. I mean, wait till you watch Luther the Fallen Son, and then you will. Uh, you've already there. said. I'd, I'd not that Wee! bothered about Luther, so I might leave it. <laughs> yeah, fine. Uh, but yeah, Ben Affleck, Batman vs Superman. He's definitely up. I've said it before. He's definitely up there. Like if people said he was their favorite Batman, I wouldn't bat an eyelid. He's just he's not a great Bruce Wayne. So I don't know if he's... Film is a slight dumpster fire, you know. Yeah, it's the spark that started a huge dumpster fire that came later on. Yeah, um, but he's better than he's better than the sort of rest of it all come together. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Holly, you number seven. I wasn't expecting to hear the name of this film come up earlier in the podcast, but it did. Um, Les Miserables and Anne Hathaway in it. Oh, um, I've child. only yeah. I've only seen this film once. I didn't enjoy it at all. Um, I haven't seen the musical on stage, mm. so this is my only um, experience of this musical. Um, I would like to see it on stage so I can get a better opinion of it. Um, but there are a couple of things that that are really wrong with the film. I think there's uh, there are a few people who are miscast, um, mostly uh, Russell Crowe, um, who who doesn't have the chops for this part. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't have the right voice no. for this part. Um, I don't like Eddie Redmayne or Amanda Seyfried in this. Oh, I, I like, love I like both this. of them in other things, mm. but their parts are very bland, and I don't know whether they're very bland in the musical, and it might they're not be bland. their fault. Um, well, there you go, then it's not their fault, but yeah. I, I just did not care about those characters one tiny little bit, because Anne Hathaway uh, starts off the film and is our main character for a short portion of the beginning of the, the film, um, and then passes away. And then the story follows the, the next generation. It follows um, Fantine and Hathaway's character's daughter and, and what happens with her. Um, but Anne Hathaway is just so, so good as Fantine at the start of the film, in my opinion. Mm. Um, she really, really gets across the, the absolute agony that this woman is going through to try and, and put food on the table for her daughter. What she's trying to 
you know, trying to do the best for her daughter and really failing because everyone around her is just so awful, but believably awful. Um, and her song, um, when she sings, I dreamed a dream, um, I, I know that Anne Hathaway isn't particularly a, a, a singer, um, but the, the pain that she has in that song, um, I listen to it over and over again, her version. I absolutely love the, the um, many people who've played the stage version. Um, and, and there are many good recordings of this song with like a different direction. I've heard this song sung like really angry, almost as if it's like, I will survive kind of, I'm, I'm strong, I will get through this kind of version. Then immediately and, dies. <laughs> yeah, and, and Hathaway's is not that. It, it's She's in total despair when yeah. her character sings this song, but it works really well. Um, mm. And then, then she dies. And at that point, I stopped caring about the film, even mm. though Hugh Jackman is in it, one of my big faves. I don't uh, like Hugh just, Jackman in this as well. That's the yeah, thing. I, I He's don't not far gone. Um, but again, I didn't feel any connection with the characters because I don't know the story. So I just mm. don't know whether I wouldn't like the story if I if I saw the the um, actual stage play and I would only like Fantine again. Um, I can't I can't tell. I think the film was very lukewarmly um, received. If I remember rightly, so yeah, I think maybe was... going to see the musical would be a better bet. But yes. and, and Hathaway's. Because it's very it's telling that, like, at... the stars, other than Anne Halfway, the star... Like, I like Eddie Redman. I think he does a decent job as Marius, because Marius is a bit of a wet lettuce. Oh, totally uh, wet lettuce. But, um, like, it's very telling that, like, Onzerat and a lot of the uh, supporting characters are just so much more um, charming and have a much bigger presence, because they're clearly just guys... Like, Samantha Barks as Eponine. She's obviously fantastic, because she knows how to perform musical theatre parts. Whereas, like, and you would think Hugh Jackman does, because that's where his start was, but his, yeah. But that 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 scene that focuses on her face way too much, because that was a weird directorial note. <laughs> that is a, it is a haunting rendition of I Dreamed a Dream. And I've yeah. never heard a version quite as haunting, because usually, because it's musicals, they're trying to focus on sounding good in the singing, which is fine. But Anne Hathaway was like, well, I'm not as good at singing as these other people, so I'll just... It just got to act it. I'll act my little socks off and mm -hmm. get an Oscar for it. And deservedly, she was fantastic. It's I think she beat of... Anthony Hopkins for like minute uh, minutes per Oscar, didn't she? Because Anthony Hopkins had like 16 minutes of screening time and got the Oscar for Silence of the Lambs. And she must have had less than 16 minutes. I don't think it was Anthony Hopkins before that. It would have been Judy Dench for Judy Shakespeare Dench, in Love. Wasn't it? For what? Shakespeare in Love. She's in it for like five minutes. Oh, well, Anthony Hopkins was before that, but yeah, Shakespeare in Love. She might still hold it then because if it's five minutes. Yeah, it's like fleeting. Just mm. going off the street. Um, <laughs> like Dustin I, Hoffman in The Holiday. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, with Les Mis, it's that whole sort of second part of the film where, like you say, they've got Amanda Seyfried and they've got Eddie Redmayne, but then those two supporting characters of Samantha Banks and Aaron Tivier are just the one step above them all the way through it. And yeah. it's, yeah. It's um, like Luke Evans and Josh Gad in Beauty and the Beast because they actually do musical theatre, they are yeah. head and shoulders above yeah. everyone yeah, yeah, else yeah, yeah. in that film. Yeah. Well, if you think about um, the Rent film, like you've got the majority of the original Broadway cast and yeah. Rosario Dawson, and you're like, does it yeah. work with Rosario Dawson? Possibly not. Yeah. Um. Right, Michael, you're number seven. Uh, number seven. He's already been in this actually. Uh, John C. Riley. Yay. Uh, in Kong Skull Island. Um, oh, okay. Is that okay. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's, not, it's not a good film, but he plays this just like crazy kind of guy who just has every scene he's in he just steals it you know and it's like when they're talking about going west he's like we have a saying uh, something like east is best and west is worst <laughs> it's just like just like random like he's clearly been there too long and he's losing it and the effect of being on this island on his own for a long time has very very clearly got a hold of him and <laughs> I mean, it's not a terrible, terrible, terrible film, but it's it's not a great film. And I think he really stands. There's good actors around him too. Samuel Jackson's there. 
Um, Brie Larson, Tom Hiddleston. Mm. Yeah, Brie Larson, Tom Hiddleston. So there's there's good people, good actors who are all excellent, and he's stealing the scene away from them. I mean, they've not got very good roles, to be fair. Like, they're good actors in bad roles, so they're doing what they can do. I was about to say, the bits um, that I've seen of Kong Skull Island, Tom, Tom Hiddleston and Brie Larson, I get the vibe that they're just not bothered about being there. <laughs> I really I don't mind because... it. I really, I, th- I, I think this newer sort of monster verse of Godzilla, King of the Monsters, um, Skull, Skull Island, and then Godzilla versus Kong. And then I'm actually quite looking forward to the next one. Like, I think they're all pretty decent. They're not bad, but, you know, they're not amazing either. Mm. Yeah. No, he's, John C. Riley's doing more than he needs to in that fundamentally. Yeah, he's a much better actor yeah, than people give him credit for. Like in Wreck It oh, Ralph, he is. he's unbelievable. He's so good in Wreck It Ralph. Like he make like he makes me feel. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, I'm going to kick us off with number six, last one for this part. Um, this is the first of two Adams that are in my list. Oh, um, my my next one's going to come up it, in part one. One. Is it a driver? It is a driver. It's a driver. It's a driver. Um, so I, I've gone with Adam Driver um, for Rise of Skywalker because he yeah. is literally, you know, he went to the chiropractor after carrying this film on his back for that long. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, I I was originally, I was, I went around the Star Wars and thought about who it was that I was going to end up going on. And because the, all these lists say Obi Wan Kenobi, uh, uh, Ewan McGregor in yeah. the prequels, and I get it. Don't mind they do. <laughs> yeah, I totally get it because he is. He's the best thing in them, right? But then part of me was like doing that thing that I do where I get a bit stubborn and I think I'm going to be a different person. I'm going to pick something else that's not been on any of these lists. And I actually <laughs> thought I could probably fight the corner for uh, Liam Neeson in Phantom Menace because I think that's pretty decent, to be fair. Um, mm-hmm. But then I thought, you know what? The person who's doing the most heavy lifting here is Adam Driver in this pile of poo. Um, now, Holly, you weren't on the Trilogy podcast, and we're recording this before it's actually come out, right? So Oliver, yeah. who hates this one, yeah? It was yeah. his number six favourite trilogy of all time. That's surprising. Because I love seven and eight. That was my logic. <laughs> if if the drop-off from more, eight to nine... More than the Dark Knight trilogy. You yeah. you did you did comment that nine is the worst film you've ever seen. I know that was Correct. my point. But I also said that the reason I think it's the worst film I've ever seen is because my hopes were so high going yeah. into it. If it had just been a slight disappointment or drop off in quality in the way that Return of the Jedi was from Empire, then I wouldn't hate it as much. I it just would love to have been in the cinema with you at the same time. I was silent. <laughs> I was silent. I like I left. And George, like Georgia, like the other two times, like leaving the cinema post Star Wars, like I'm with Georgia and I'm just holding back, not even successfully holding back tears. So I'm just so happy with what I've seen. I've just been transported back to this universe that I love. And then this time I was just like, what the hell was that? And like Georgia was worried because I was like genuinely angry. Like I did, I get, I get that. But honestly, if Rise of Skywalker was an okay film, like on par with the prequels, and that's not asking a lot, if it was on par with the prequels, it would have been even higher up. Because I I love, I genuinely love 7 and 8. I think, I, I love 8. I will defend 8 to the death. Um, and I know you don't like 8 that much, and I get that. You don't dislike it for the same reasons that make me angry with people, so I'm fine with you disliking it. But, yeah, like... Adam Driver is fa- is phenomenal in that throughout, except for the bit where he has to do the same old nonsense of, oh, yeah, I, I, you just misunderstood what I said. No, we didn't, Kylo. You told me plain as day. My parents were nobody, but we're retconning it now for some reason. Just, ugh. <laughs> yeah, it's just like everything that he was doing was, it felt like a, this is the end to my character's arc, so it needs yes. to go off on a big one. And yeah. it, everything that he was doing was that. It was the sort of ending of Kylo. It was the ending of Ben, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was just like nothing else in the film was matching what it was that he was doing. Yeah. So, like, there's, to there's, the point where the Daisy Adam. Ridley's performance was much better when she's acting against him. Mm. 
Like that was noticeable. Like I cared more about Ray when she was interacting with Kylo Ren and interacting with Ben. Like the kiss was a bit forced. Yeah. But I get, I do like the idea that's there of a light and a dark side kind of feeling feelings for one another. Like that's an interesting concept that I just don't think was very well explored. But it meant that her performance was elevated by him. So he, he is a good shout. I had him in my honourable mentions for a reason. So I'm, I'm not angry with your pick yeah, there. Yeah. Um, Are you not merciful? <laughs> <laughs> Holly, you're number six. Holly or Ollie? Holly, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Adam. <laughs> I do apologise. It's Lila. It's just easy. I'm all of it for the purposes of this podcast. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, Star Wars again. I'm sorry to to be uh, repetitive, uh, but I've gone for Ray Park as Darth Maul in The Phantom Menace. Um, Ray Park rather than Peter Serafinovich. Um, what you mean his two lines? Yeah, his two <laughs> lines are uh, uninspiring and unnecessary. Um, I, the, I was... Uh, excited to see this villain um when it came out in cinemas um and i saw the posters and the trailer and i thought this villain looked brilliant mm. i know now that it, it didn't really look brilliant like his face paint and everything was was very non-traditionally star wars and a bit weird but i there there's a physicality to that character without him saying anything mm. that still makes him a, a memorable villain in Star Wars, a, a huge series with many, many memorable villains. I think of him as pretty much the only good thing about Phantom Menace. Um, the part where he's stuck behind the force field and he's pacing oh. like a caged cat, like, that bit is really, really strong memory. And Qui-Gon's um, kneeling at the same time. Yeah. It shows the mindset. Yeah, that's really good. Um, that, many people have written about how Darth Maul was a horrible missed opportunity to have him as a recurring enemy going through all three films. And I mm. absolutely think they should have. Um, so, yeah, it, it felt... He does his, come back, his role. He is good when he comes back. Well, that's him being retconned. He doesn't come back in the films. So that was never... He doesn't come back in the films. That was Dave Filoni recognising, no, you you, you messed up here, George. I'm going to give Sam Witwer this role. Sam Witwer, who's the only person who's a bigger Star Wars nerd than me, who's now played at least 15 characters in Star Wars, and he's great at all of them. Um, And yet, like, his duel with uh, Ben Kenobi on the Sons of Tatooine... Is so good <laughs> because they've actually got it. But like, yeah, what a missed opportunity to like have Obi Wan have this villain that he has that personal connection with, and yeah, you could have even... killed his beloved mentor. Yeah, and you could have even had the fake out that like if you'd had Christopher Lee as Dooku in the first film, you could have had the fake out that he was the Sith master. And we all forget, oh yeah, Palpatine's a thing because we didn't know his name was Palpatine until later on. So no one knew he was just the Emperor. But, uh, oh, Christopher Lee's the Emperor. Nope. <laughs> He's hiding in plain sight. <laughs> like... yeah. I th- I'm sure a running theme with this list, and it's already come up several times, is, you know, they did the best they could with what they were given. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, like, Ray Park ha- was given nothing, apart from some face paint, which the fans didn't like. <laughs> um, and he overpowers that with just a presence which is menacing mm. um and yeah great job couldn't have done better mm. yeah uh michael you're number six uh yeah he's already been said actually but as an honorable mention in someone else's i think you said you were going you could have said him uh so michael clark duncan uh daredevil <laughs> um so no i think you were saying you don't mind it it's a trash it's it's an Unredeemable film. You just, just, just so, so, so bad. No, nope. it, it is, but it is so good. And I think you can, because I really like Wilson Fisk in the Daredevil TV series, and I think they took a lot from this. I think they, um, you know, the kind of presence he has and that 
calm and then doing something incredibly violent and then being calm again. Um, and he does it, and he does it. Like, like I said, I, the Daredevil in the Wilson Fisk and the Daredevil team. TV series for me is now the definitive Daredevil. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The definitive. I mean, it's the definitive Daredevil as well, to be fair. Um, but I can absolutely see the start of that here. And had it been a better overall movie, Michael Clark Duncan's a good enough actor to have been as good as that. So for him to shine as well as he does in absolute trash, again, I'm sorry, but it is. I can't. It is. Ass, nothing, come on. It's my crap it's so, movie. So it's my number one. It's awful. I love it though. Yeah. It's so good. I think there is a better argument for Colin Farrell in this though. Yeah, Colin Farrell is just he's he's an absolute delight. I mean, the one that surprised me reading up on all these lists is that one list said Jennifer Garner in Daredevil. I was like, what? She was whoa. She's the worst thing about it. A lot of people really like Elektra as a character, and weirdly, some people really like the Elektra movie. I mean, I know I'm defending kind of... Daredevil, but that's trash. <laughs> just that's hot know. garbage. But yes, that's, I think so. I think so. It's just Jennifer Garner in it, and some people are just it's like maybe they think it's the thirteen going on thirty character grown up and become Electra and the <laughs> attaching that love to it. I don't know, um, mm. but no, it's it's. I mean, yeah, Farrell's good in it, um, but I don't know. I think I just prefer. I like Wilson Fisk as a character. So yeah. I, I kind of I enjoy portrayals of him because even in the Spider-Man video game, he's quite good. I think he's a bit a... more traditional in the Spider-Man game. Yeah, there was a bit before when we were doing the villains list where I thought, oh no, I've left Kingpin off. But yeah, then I thought, well, actually... Spider-verse. Yeah, well, I th- into the Spider-Verse and then I would have still included Daredevil. But then I thought, oh, actually, no, we're separating TV and really it is, it's the D'Onofrio the one. Fisk that Absolutely, really... Yeah, because yeah. I'm re-watching him at the minute. Um, so every time I go and cook in the kitchen, I, I stick like half an hour on mm. of whatever episode that I'm up to. And he's so like cold and calculated. And I've recently done the episode where he's on a date with this the yes. woman that he meets. Vanessa. Yeah. Oh, with Vanessa. And, yeah. And um, one of the Anatoly brothers. Intru- yeah. Interrupts you just me. He just, he turns to Wesley and just goes, put him in a car. And like Wesley knows exactly what he means. And then it's mm. like, Door, 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 squish noise, and you're like, "Yep, that's him done for." Yeah, mm. yeah. Ooh, I, uh, if I'm nitpicking, I just find his voice a bit distracting. He's, he's putting on the the chances that we have been good. Like, it's a weird voice from Denofrio. I don't like it because it is. It's strange and it kind of. I I find that as a part of the character, and because it's like the entire Wilson Fisk is a. Um, like a mirage, isn't it? He's actually yeah. just a very evil man, but he puts on this persona of a calm, suave, but he's not. There's absolute rage, oh, yeah, rage and hatred inside of him. And he is what... his dad, he is his father. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And that, that episode where you're seeing the backstory to him, yeah, like tells you everything you need to know. Don't... But the, the weird one that I had when I watched Daredevil is it was 2015, so I watched that. Same year as Jurassic World, then seeing Vincent D'Onofrio in Jurassic World, where he's just like hands on hips going, sort these raptors out then. Let's go. Go on, let's sort these. I'm like, what's this? I rewatched so Men in Black, people. the original, not long. And I was like, there's no oh, way. This is brilliant the same. in Men in Black. <laughs> but you still wouldn't put them together, though, would you? No, it's so no. bizarre. And I was like, oh, um, he's actually the same guy. Oliver, last one. Uh, me number six. Um, I believe I'm slightly trashing on a film that Michael likes here, but I don't think he likes it with any great love. It is Hannibal. Um, the book's a mess, and the film still manages to do it worse because, like, the whole point of the book is that um, Starling is ge- he's genuinely falling out of favor with the FBI because of a, a, a litany of like bad decisions and bad moments. Whereas the opening of this film shows she holds a gun on a suspect who's holding a child. We don't know if she's actually holding a child. And the suspect pulls a gun on her. She waits until the last possible minute, shoots the subject, manages to not hit the kid. And it's like, oh, she's a disgrace. It's like, that's, I don't know. I can't imagine any FBI agent being lambasted in the press for, you know, shooting at someone that was shooting at them when, you know, whatever. But 
Also, this is America, and you can yeah, it's America, like all the FBI. Um, it's fine. So. And Anthony Hopkins is a bit weird in this one. They like it's not his fault, but they keep trying to push this catchphrase of "okie dokie." It's like no. <laughs> What are you doing? That's not in the box for a start. So you can't blame the box as being like the reason that they're trying to do this. It's just, it feels like either a scriptwriter or trying to make him more lighthearted. Yeah, but it's only the man. It's a, it's a, he's, it's as he's about to disembowel. You've not told us who you've picked. You, well, who do you think? I'm assuming Gary Oldman. Oh, it's Gary talking Oldman. About the film. Can we talk about uh, Gary Oldman, please? I'm building it up. It's two o'clock. It's Gary Oldman. <laughs> it's Gary Oldman as Mason Verger, one of probably one of the most detestable characters in media. Like, I can't think of anybody who is fundamentally as unlikable as that. And Gary Oldman just plays him with such villainous glee underneath a lot of heavy prosthetics as well. And Quite very limited, yes, yeah, yeah, very limited motion because the story of Mason Verger is that he's a complete quadriplegic. Um, He's a surviving. Um, he's a survivor of one of Lecter's attacks. Lecter broke his neck whilst he was um, hanging himself whilst doing something else to himself that we won't talk about on the podcast. Um, and he gave him a bunch of psychedelic drugs and told him to cut his face off and feed it to his dogs. And then when he'd finished that, he kicked the chair from underneath him and he broke his neck, but he survived. And he carries a lot of vengeance from that. And if it was just like, oh, he's a sympathetic character because he's just trying to get back at him. No, because he's... Is is he confirmed paedophile? Or is he just hinted at as being a paedophile? I mean, it, in the series, it's definitely, like, confirmed. Yeah, and yeah. he, like, in the series, doesn't he perform a hysterectomy on his sister yeah. while she's pregnant to... Like, cause, he, cause she, he has this hold over her as well, and he like abuses her, cause her, the dad is like saying, "Oh, I'm, I'm not accepting you, cause you're a lesbian, cause he's an awful person." It's gonna go to Mason, even though I know he's a psychopath and a rapist and a pedophile. Like, I think of every horrible buzzword you can, and he is that guy. Awesome. And he's just, yeah, he's just he hams it up a bit as Gary Oldman is one to do, but. It's just so much fun to watch him. And then when you watch everything out, like Anthony Hopkins just looks like a tired old man in this. I hate to say that because I love Anthony Hopkins, but he does just look like a tired old man in like all the stuff they're trying to get him to do. He was great in the first film because he was just stuck in a cage and we could look at him. Whereas now he's like out and about and wearing like normal human clothes. So it's just like, no. <laughs> no. Is... He's also so much younger in Silence of the Lambs that so much he has younger. a bit of a, like, a bit of a physicality to him. It's that, that, that ten year gap is what happened between Jude Law and Richard Harris for Dumbledore. Yeah, like, teaching just, teaching will do just that. Just went too, yeah. straight down. <laughs> we we can attest <laughs> teaching will do that. <laughs> Uh, right, that's it for part one. We, we'll be back next week for part two of our uh, good performance. Shame about the film. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening. Stay safe. Uh, and see you next time. <laughs>